can political leaders and large corporations turn to for advice. Today, for the Republic Summit, he brings with him a civilizational perspective. of Indian civilizational nationalism. Namaskarams to all. I am delighted to be here at the Third Republic Summit. You know, it has been a privilege to be here and even greater privilege to be invited by Arna personally. Every time he calls me and makes me speak. And I don't speak on very easy topics. I always talk on very difficult topics. And uh, after two days of hearing so many people in so many occasions, so many subjects that uh, in the penultimate session you will be listening to a very, very tough topic which is important in the context of where our country is placed, where the world stands. Because these are not debated, these are not part of the national discourse quite unfortunately. No one doubts that India is a rising influencer of the world. I am not going higher than that, whether it is a geopolitical power, whether its impact on the world is, as many people talk it out to be, a great influencer has emerged in the world in the last seven, eight years, and particularly since the advent of COVID and thereafter the Ukraine war, there has been a shift in the global positioning of India and in the context of where the world is and it has been for the last uh, 50 years and more. What does this mean for India and the world? And this is something on which we need to have some idea. A rising India in an integrated world needs a strategic national narrative about itself. See, the idea of India has been so distorted, has been so trivialized, in fact, that we need to look back and collect where, what India that we are talking about, understanding, and what India we will talk about to the world, because we are supposed to be this particular audience, and this television setup, the intellectual and the media group is what is supposed to be the window of India to the world and of the world to India. And so it has certain very important responsibilities. So in this context, we need to have a narrative about us. But this idea of national narrative has evolved into national strategic narrative in the last one decade, and it is very, very intensely discussed in the American system. The more America back takes over global responsibilities and the world gets more and more integrated, it becomes an important task for a nation to define itself to itself and to the world. And this exercise is going on in America, and there are American armies involved in it, State Department is involved in it, think tanks are involved in it, but this is not a subject in which any great thinking is taking place in India. And so it is, as someone who has always felt that 
India is underrepresenting itself. It's my duty to alert through Republic TV. This is an important uh, and uh, uh, a very committedly nationalist voice to uh, take up this subject. <clears throat> what can be and should be India's strategic narrative is something on which not only the strategic thinkers, intellectuals, educationists, and also the media should be concerned and should be focusing on in the coming years because we are already late. See, if you look at uh, the reasons why we should be developing or evolving or formulating a national strategic narrative for India, is that the world order is changing and changing rapidly. After World War II and post-World War, there was some kind of a stable world order. But suddenly everything changed with the advent of the Chinese and the rise of China. And that shook the world, Western world, in a manner that an underdog which they facilitated to rise is the one that posed the biggest challenge to it. This is something which the business interests of the West felt it was in their interest to do. That turned against the geopolitical interests of the entire Western leadership of the world. This happened in just 10 years. And when the COVID struck, Henry Kissinger said that the world order would change forever. That is the only word he used. He didn't explain what change it would be, from where to what. And then when the Ukraine war came, both Kissinger and George Soros addressed the World Economic Forum last year, in which Kissinger said that the world order would get permanently restructured. These are very important words because these are all normal people, so extraordinary men who have shaped the world order. What did he mean by the world order will get permanently restructured is very important for Indian intellectuals, Indian media, Indian academic institutions, Indian geopolitical thinkers to ponder over. And Jar Soros went a step ahead. He said that whether the Western civilization will survive or not is the question. By a shift in the world order, why should the Western civilization feel threatened unless there is congruity, convergence between the Western civilization and the world order, West-led world order? These are all important questions for us to ponder. So there is relationship between the West-led world order and Western civilization. In the last decade particularly, more particularly in the last four or five years, there is a trend in the world. There is a rising civilizational paradigm. In the centenary of the Chinese Communist Party, Xi Jinping made a very special reference to the 5,000 years of, 5,000 years old Chinese civilization which is capable of guiding China in future. When did the communists begin talking about 5,000 year old civilization guiding them in future? When they said the entire past is to be discarded in 1965, they tried to destroy everything that would connect the Chinese to their past. And the entire ideology was cast aside that history only moves forward and doesn't look back. And Xi Jinping said, that this 5,000 year civilization is what is going to guide them in future. It is because no nation can survive on a global ideology today. Communism was a global ideology which failed at the global level and it failed at Chinese level and what leaves that, where does it leave Xi Jinping to keep Chinese game going, Chinese aspirations going, Chinese ambitions move ahead. It's only China. And you have to look back. So the civilizational regrouping that is taking place in the world is something which is not 
only not understood it is not being debated in a sense it is opposed in india the civilizational rise of india is unfortunately a topic of adversarial discussion and that is also one of the things which i would like to point out then the world order is changing means the world had been under a hegemonic order the american hegemony was the anchor of the world order the center for foresight of the european union has come out with a very solid research document in which they have made several points the most important of which is the world is no more going to see a hegemonic power running over them it will be a kind of diffused powers and there will be multiple power centers in the world not 20 years from now 5 years from now 7 years from now, by 2030 the center for foresight has prognosticated that half the geopolitical economic and military power would have shifted from the west to asia these are all very major changes and another reason the west which rode over the rest during the colonial period and later they be- they began integrating the world in their own way integrating the world resulted in short term games in the world the ideologies the models which the west developed became shorter and shorter in their shelf life for example colonialism lasted for 200 years mercantile capitalism lasted for 100 years marxism lasted for 50 years globalization is over in 25 years all that you are projecting as the future forever is crashing in its life there is nothing today to hold the world together because they thought globalization world market technology global order rule based trading rule based law norms relationships this will hold the world together but that is what has been badly shaken now and even more important is that all that will ensure normative stability for example take the business a business the businessman would think that there should be proper succession for his business he will be preparing his son he will be preparing somebody you know from that today from preparing next generation your whole focus is on quarterly results and a whole nation is shaken by overnight interest rates because the overnight interest rates can shake the world market shift billions of dollars from one market to the other and cause havoc so this short termism of the west is one of the reasons why civilizational consciousness is rising in the rest of the world and the most important thing is the chinese rise you know deng xiaoping said let us bide our time and let us wait hide and bide this is a long term strategy anyone in the west any great geopolitical thinker in the west would have understood that china is playing a long term game whereas you are playing a short term game you are seeking profits you are seeking quarterly bonus you are seeking uh how to raise the stock market to keep the social security obligations fill you know the paradigm is one set of nations which had the leadership of the world was completely driven by short term goals and another set of nations which were developing and today 56% of the world lives under autocracy they are not going to look to the west democratic west they will look only to the autocratic china and those countries they are long term players so the short term versus long term put the west in such difficulty and on a lighter side there is an inherent limitation in the west to think of long term because even theologically they didn't understand the life of the world beyond 100 years or 1000 years but take india we understood the world 
or the creation in terms of hundreds of billions of years and we are looking at the world and the entire creation lasting for trillions of years you know you may think that this is something an imagination in the west used to laugh at us for saying that the creation took place hundreds of billions of years ago and when we measured the world and the universe in these they all used to laugh at us now cosmology is laughing at the west you understand the shift that has taken place that a society which is running on scales which is different from the west is now challenging i am going to cite an article which appeared in the in a very profound article rarely the bbc carries a profound article one article which appeared in the bbc is an important article it's about the short termism of the west and the more important thing is the time scales which drive the west modern society is suffering from temporal exhaustion sociology is alive bolding one said most important words i am going to quote please listen if one is mentally out of breath all the time dealing with the present there is no energy left for imagining the future this is the problem of the west you are caught you are caught you will continue to be caught in such immediate problems that you will never be able to think of what the problems are going to be 5 years from now 10 years from now certainly not 50 years from now and very strangely they say silicon valley engineers building a giant clock that will tick for 10000 years is something which the world must look at what these thinkers from myriad fields share is a simple idea that the longevity of a civilization depends on our extending our time frame in reference how much long we think the world had been and how long the world will be in future these are the things which impose obligations on us and this is not something which happened so short termism is in the western dna long termism in the is in the asian dna now you look at how the time long long time frame not really means recalling the long past it also means visualizing at the deep future ahead i will give you two examples from the indian tradition one is the grandfather planting a mango sapling which he is not going to enjoy it is for his son grandson great grandson what was his idea all of us have read this in our schools that this is how you measure up to the future your responsibilities for future this is an old example traditional example i will give you some modern example barry bobsworth of brookings institution he studied the savings pattern in asia and in america he said the savings in america is personal savings a man may save or may not save he saves for himself he doesn't save for anybody else but he says the asian savings is dynastic very important that you think of three generations later several generations later gives you a certain stability and that stability is lacking in the west the next important thing is why with all these faults inherent faults which are perceivable by the results that the west has produced which are short term results the the rest look to the west once we understand this and once we understand what kind of shift is taking place from the assumptions on which the rest was look, looking to the west then we will understand where does asia stands where does the west stand where does india stand and in that the most important thing is the west expounded a theory that it was the source of modernity it sourced the modernity to the enlightenment movement and said everything followed it is only enlightenment which made the process of the west which made the world as it is today otherwise there was no world in fact william mcneil exalted the rise of the in the rise of the west in his book 
we and all the world of the 20th century are peculiarly the key creatures and heirs of a handful of geniuses of the early modern europe very important you know this entire theory has been discredited in 2012 by the western researchers themselves there was one sebastian konrad one of the greatest historiographers of germany he came out with his publication in 2012 that the entire idea that the west is the source of modernity has been completely challenged by the rest whether it is china whether it is japan whether it is korea or india all of them have their own process of modernizing themselves even the very civilizational regeneration which they have been seeing from time to time is their own autogenous understanding of modernity and so you cannot say west is the source of modernity but this is what the west made us believe that west means modern and we are all backward why the west was able to sell its ideas why i am saying all this is i have nothing against the west but you are such an unsustainable model for yourself which you have created for the world which the world is suffering from today and where does india stand in this because india is having a very special responsibility in the current situation so we have to now understand the western failures unless you understand the western failures it will be difficult for us to position us position the rest position the west in regard to each other this is a very very important responsibility see the the rise of the non western civilizations as i said have challenged the theory that west is the source of modernity another important development is another important aspect of the west declaring itself as the source of modernity is that the west had very long dark ages in which it millions and millions of people were slaughtered and killed so it said these are all dark ages and you know we connect ourselves to the greek or roman civilization which is an enlightened civilization scientific civilization rational civilization and in between in these 1500 years whatever happened is a dark age for us it is dark age for them no doubt about it but there was no dark age for us they imposed a dark age on asia and on india and said it is oriental despotism karl marx said it is oriental despotism you people also had your own dark ages but the oriental despotism theory has been completely discredited encyclopedia britannica said this is an invalid theory but still the marxist are laying on the oriental despotism and the asiatic model of production even today i am not getting into it but the simple point i want to make is the west claimed it had dark ages and imposed dark ages on us but there is one simple research which has destroyed all this professor r j ramal of hawaii university he went into 2500 years of human beings slaughtering human beings all over the world and he put it on a 33 year research he put it on a website power kills it is called democide in which he said in this 2500 years 1.2 billion people have been slaughtered in human action against human action human beings and till the 13th century there was no mass killing in india 1.2 billion people were slaughtered and till 13th century there was no mass killing in india and you say india had dark ages india's dark ages began with invasions from outside india did not generate by its own sociological behavior any dark ages this is a matter of research your own research but this is not what we are taught this is not what we are told this is not what we are made to understand about ourselves then only we can make others understand gentlemen we don't have dark age but we accepted we have dark age and we produced lot of research materials so this cast did this to this this cast i mean every society has a past american society has a past which will never like to recall the number of people who were eliminated in the whole expedition 
and they wrote a new america the number is almost almost 200 million they wrote a new they, they had a new they wrote the nation on a clean slate every nation had a past a baggage a continuity rights and wrongs hostility everything all other nations had the only nation which did not have this problem is america and it is the sociology it is the philosophy it is the politics it is the law that is developed by that society which wrote itself on a clean slate is made is being made the rule for the rest today for example the supreme court is dealing with the same sex marriage but do you mean to say this will work in any society the laws that were developed the principles that were developed the norms that were developed the relationship that were developed in america will it work elsewhere a society in which 55% of the first marriages end in divorce 67% of the seven second marriages end in divorce if somebody had a desire to marry 74% of the third marriages end in divorce 28% of the people only live as husband and wife with children in home 49% of the people live without children and with anybody with anybody and single parent and all their burden is being taken care of by the government families have been nationalized you know what is the social security burden of america which is unfunded today according to the social security system site 63 trillion dollars is the unfunded social security obligations and in india all the social security obligations are taken over by the families it's privatized in india imagine if this obligation is nationalized the families are nationalized there will be no government in this country this is the civilizational difference it's not just this in america in the year 1960 we had 3.3 people living per house today it is 2.5 this reduction of 0.8 persons per house meant construction of 32 million more houses and the cost was 8.5 trillion dollars over and above all the appurtenances that goes to build the cost of the house and the environmental cost over and above all this in india we have 4.5 persons per house living in this country if this number comes down by just one we will need 60 million more houses if it comes equivalent to america we will need 140 million more houses there will be no space in india there will be no money in india do we understand economics in a civilizational sense in a cultural sense in a spiritual sense there is a way of life and unless you understand this differential which operates largely in asia more in india and china is an example of neither because it is such a regimented society what happens in china what will happen in china even the chinese people do not know today what will be the end of china which is such an iron rock what will happen if it melts so the most important thing is that the indian society indian civilization indian way of life indian family system indian economy indian savings and even investment you know only 9% of our savings gets into stock market manmohan singh and chidambaram said in 2005 please don't go to the banks go to stock market but people are not going in japan which does not give which gives negative returns the bank gives if you deposit 1000 rupees in a bank at the end of the year the bank will give 990 rupees to you but still people deposit 51% of their savings in banks and get take negative returns that is the characteristics of japanese economy japanese stock market has all the modern uh, products but the japanese do not deal in them it is the foreigners who deal in them that is the character of the japanese economy so there is a civilizational alignment between the people their way of life their economy their savings the type of savings the risk savings they make in fact many economists have asked them this question if universal social security had not been provided to the americans will the americans invest in stock market in the way they are investing today they will not 
because you have to take care of your children you have to take care of yourself you have to take care of your parents if all these obligations are with you will you put your money in stock market and more than that the pension funds the insurance funds and other funds they have invested most of the money in stock market today almost 50 to 60% of the investment is in stock market if the stock market crashes it will not be the crash of stock market only it will not be the crash of only some corporate sector it will be the crash of the entire economy so this is one set of issues which you have to deal with a society which does not have stable families which does not have a stable civilizational drive will hand over the responsibilities to the state and this will be the consequence which may be a country with one fourth population as india america can handle but a country with four times the population of america can never handle this so there is a civilizational orientation to india which we are not conscious of we are not even speaking about it our public discourse system doesn't talk about it our educational system does not alert us to this our media is completely oblivious but the reality is this now i will tell you how our whole idea has been manipulated you know there is a beautiful book written by one thomas mckevelly the title of the book is the shape of ancient thought this book came out in 2001 about the source of world civilization there are two books i am dealing with this book in which the most important reference that comes is when the colonial powers went around the world and colonized and they found the colonized people did not have proper literature they didn't have the language didn't have any grammar but when they came to india they found that the language of the colonized people is the language of the master that is sanskrit so then they said no 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 sanskrit is our language it is indo aryan language it is the we came and taught you sanskrit understood this was the 19th century position in 20th century something stunning happens in 1924 harappa is discovered once harappa is discovered that was a very superior civilization they said this is dravidian these uh, pastoral aryans invaded and destroyed the dravidian civilization and brought about division amongst us in just 100 years they also said india was never one country we made it into one country through our post office through our uh, railways in fact there is a beautiful uh, dialogue between mahatma gandhi as the reader and mahatma gandhi as the editor there is one of the books which must be taught in every school in college which we are not doing we talk about mahatma gandhi but his core ideas are not being discussed one of the ideas one of the questions that the reader gandhi puts to the editor gandhi he doubles as a reader and as an editor answering the questions the reader asks mr gandhi it is only the british who made us into one country what do you say about it this is what they are saying because this is how the british used to say that we taught you english that is why you got the idea of freedom we made the post office and railways that is why you are one country mahatma gandhi said his answers were always very simple there is no complication no intellectual inquiry needed but no intellectual can dispute it also he said they could make one government because we were already one nation second point he made was very important you see we are the only people in the country who can worship god within us we can worship god in the in the family but the only thing is we established char dhams we established all this outside made millions of people go from one end of the country to the other for what you know this is how we made india into one these are all facts jawarlal nehru wrote in 1935 that indian nationalism and hindu nationalism cannot be segregated because india is the only country of hindus and i don't have any dispute with vivekananda's 
Hindu nationalism because it was not against anybody. 1935. Glimpses of India, Glimpses of World History, page 502. And then, Rajini Palmedat, who established the Communist Party, a communist from India who established the Communist Party in, in England, he said that the British say that because they taught us English, they established educational institutions, we got the idea of freedom. But even if the British had not done that, in the, uh, from the isolated Vedapada Shalas of India, from our Upanishads and Vedas, we would still have got the idea and slogans for freedom. Rajini Paul Medhat wrote in 1939. The moment Jinnah passed the Lahore resolution for partition of India, all these people orphaned the idea of ancient Hindu nationalism. And afterwards, you know what happened in the post-independent India. Jawaharlal Nehru's first declaration was that Hindu communalism is dangerous, Muslim communalism is aggressive, so we have to focus on containing the more dangerous thing. Will a Prime Minister talk like this? That governed the whole thing. The entire thing had to be reversed by a popular movement. And that resulted in the idea of Indian nationalism taking roots and ultimately the Supreme Court of India mainstreamed it in the Hindutva judgment. So we must understand there is a struggle to bring back the pre-independence values through mass struggle and by a process which is now being normalized and this is going to be the civilizational narrative of India to the world. There is many more points to be covered, but because we are in a strange situation, the Prime Minister is coming, other ministers are there, and I would not like to proceed further except to say that we need to be very clear that there is a civilizational underpinning to India, and unless we grasp it, we articulate it, we understand it, we cannot make the world understand, and so it is very important for us to focus on this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Guru Murthy, sir. We have a really a tight schedule. We've got uh, the Union Minister for Road, Transport and Highways, Mr. Nitin Gadkari here already. Ladies and gentlemen, we're on transformation of India, the highway to success. Our next guest is sharp as an arrow and holistically committed to the cause of development. He has never shied away from a challenge, no matter what the odds. And since his initiation into politics, Mr. Gadkari has fought to